Welcome to Politics Done Right. My name is Egberto Willis, your host at KPFT. As usual, we are going to have a great show for you guys today. We have some special guests in this in the studio. The ebb and flow of the migration of bodies from Central America, South America, and beyond have its genesis and policies we ultimately create that benefit U.S. corporations. A case in point was the CIA-induced overthrow of Guatemala's first democratically elected president, Jacobo uh, Arvenz Guzman, in late June 1954. He established policies that would redistribute unused land in the country. When the powerful American-owned United Fruit Company lost many acres of land, the CIA came to the rescue. The country has never recovered. The United States spent billions of dollars in El Salvador to prop up the right-wing oligarchs and generals that rule the country. They wanted no part in improving the lives of the peasants, those who really need the average Salvadorian. The wealthy in the country owns most of the land, including the best lands to grow coffee and important export. Well, we have two great people in studio today with us. We have... Uh, Maria Vilma Duran, who is the producer of uh, Little Central America 1984, as well as Ruben Martinez, who is in from Los Angeles and the son and grandson of immigrants from Mexico and El Salvador. He is a writer, performer, and teacher. He is the author of Desert America, A Journey Across our most la our divided landscape and crossing over a Mexican family on the migrant trail and other titles. Welcome aboard Politics and Right. How are you guys doing today? Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much for having us. Well, of course. I mean, uh, when I heard about you from, you know, Stuart, uh, our, one of our uh, electric, I mean, our, our board operators in there, he really came and he saw the play and he said, you know, uh, Egberto, you should really check these guys out because this was boss. That's what he said. This was boss. So uh, I tell you what, as a local producer here, um, Maria, why don't you tell me a little bit about uh, Little Central America in 1984, the genesis, how it came about? Well, I mean, I, I've really come into the I've really come into the process, uh, I think, after the genesis. So um, Ruben would definitely be the one to talk about that. But I mean, you know, my experience has been amazing mm -hmm. being able to be part of this project and, you know, really being able to highlight um, our community, our Central American community, which is which is big, which is thriving, you know, here in Houston. But Ruben, you know, I, I think he would definitely be the one to, to talk about. Well, that. Dude, she, pa she passed the baton, Ruben. She passed the baton. I, I will go back and forth. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, I, I really liked your analysis at the top of the show about the global uh, situation and the ebb and flow of migration. Uh, in the, I, everybody in this room, right? Or immigrants. Yes. And, and, I, I, and at this table, we're, we're all from Central, Central America. America. Panama, Salvador, Salvador. That's there right. we go. Que viva Centro America. Viva Centro America. Sí. And uh, being Central American, being the son of a Salvadoran psychologist and poet, Vilma Angulo, rest in peace, my mom, uh, I've always been aware of how our community is relatively invisible compared to other Latin American in Mexico, yes. of course. And I'm half Mexican, yes. so I can't like say you can't it's you can't hit it too hard, now. Mexico, <laughs> you know. But um, you know, if we, if we the Mexican hegemony, if we can call it that, right. you know, overshadows our community a lot. And um, I had the great pleasure of being in Houston and teaching at the University of Houston for several years in the early 2000s, and got to know the community a little bit at that point. And coming back with this project, Little Central America 1984 is a tour of a few cities in the United States that have big Central American populations. The Bay Area of California, uh, Washington, D.C., and here in Houston. And uh, we are recreating through poetry and music, live music and uh, theater, um, a moment in our history. We say 1984, Little Central America 1984 mm -hmm. is, the, is the title. 1984, because that's when our community was really right. starting to come together. Right. The numbers of people that had arrived and the community establishing itself through social service agencies for the refugees at that time and, get, and finding its political voice here right. through solidarity with the, the, the struggle for uh, justice and liberation in Central America at that time, but also establishing its own presence and seeking justice uh, here with all the problems we have in American cities, right? And discrimination and policing and all those things. So a, a generation later, we have a new wave of refugees that have arrived, a uh, new set of challenges, but we're looking back to 1984 
at all the things that our community got right. You know, all the solidarity that was expressed back then through the sanctuary movement, the churches who opened their doors to the refugees, and all the people who had organizing experience from their home countries of Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, um, who were expelled from the country because of their organizing right. down there. Well, they come up here with a lot of organizing skills. Right. And so we have social service agencies like the Central American Resource Center, CRESEN, that, whose roots are back in the 1980s. So we're looking back to look forward is basically the idea. Now, production. this is an artistic presentation, however. I, I haven't had the honor to see it yet. This is an artistic presentation. In the art that you're bringing out, are you also exposing the political parts of it? Or is it mostly sure. just the goody, feely thingy? <laughs> we definitely want good feelings. And that comes through the experience of music. I mean, we have a cumbia, right. you know, going on. Yes. We a little really dancing. Got, and, and Maria Vilma is reading poetry uh -huh. along with, you know, I just wanted to you know, throw it to Maria Vilma for, for a second here because uh, we're coming, we're doing a national tour. Right. But here in Houston, all our partners are the local community. Right. So, Maria Vilma, maybe you can talk about the Central American Collective and all the people who are involved in the production through the Central American Collective. Yeah, no, uh, you know, one of the great things about this production has mm -hmm. been being able to include our community members and also um, giving, making sure that we're all included. So right. we have, um, for example, Susana, uh, Susana Oshlat, who um, she uh, is the leader of Chapinas de Corazon, mm -hmm. um, a Guatemalan um, group, yeah. group. We have a local poet, Alba Herrera, mm -hmm. um, Elmer Romero, who's with uh, Crescent. Um, and so it's just, it's beautiful to you know be able to to bring everybody together to be part of this you know to be a voice right. um you know and then i'm i'm part of it as well i i wasn't expecting that piece but I, i'm, I'm oh, very you didn't happy expect, you didn't expect that you were going to be doing your own poetry or I, you know I, I was more behind the scenes and uh -huh. then was brought into the scene so <laughs> well, did ruben do that to you or <laughs> ruben and elia <laughs> yeah, our, our director elia i said my co-writer she's not here this morning she couldn't be here but uh her her practice mm -hmm. as a theater artist is very community based that mm -hmm. she comes out of the radical theater of the 1960s explain that explain that radical theater like and uh, the bread and puppet theater for mm -hmm. example uh back east and the living theater in washington dc and uh, uh the mime troupe in san francisco the roots of radical theater go further back but basically you know breaking through the fourth wall mm -hmm. involving the community here we have a, a beautiful salvadoran family the benitez family uh, a father and his four daughters mm -hmm. are playing a key role uh, in acting moments, milestone moments in any family's history, but that are very poignant specifically for immigrant families, mm -hmm. right? And we're, look, we're also telling the story of the families that didn't get a chance to celebrate those milestones. For example, Oscar Alberto Martinez and his daughter Valeria, who died drowned in the Rio Grande mm -hmm. in 2019. That's the one with the little girl, yeah. Yes. yes. I think we all remember yes. that we have that image in our heads. I mean, never goes her down right there uh, on the banks. That yes. was sad. Yeah. Yes. So we remember those who were lost mm -hmm. on the journey. Mm -hmm. and celebrate those who have made it. Mm -hmm. You asked about the politics. Right. I mean, uh, we tell, we definitely tell the story of what happened the, the, that gave rise to the civil wars in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. It drives me crazy that people of our generation, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, know this story intimately. Right. But that young people, you know, do not yeah. re really remember you yeah. Know? I mean, you know, I, I came here when I was five years old. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I don't, you don't remember. You remember Salvador? Um, luckily, I was able to go back and, and um, you know, every other summer and, and spend time over there with my family. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know all those other pieces. Right. You know, I wasn't aware of it. And then even the, the much younger generations, right. they are completely... They have absolutely no idea. <laughs> you, you know what is amazing? That this is just a, seg a quick segue here. Um, I remember in 19, I think it was 1988, right before the invasion of Panama, oh, we were right. flying into Panama, but we took TACA. And you know, TACA is centralized oh, yeah. in El Salvador. So we were flying into TACA. And, we, and the, the, at that time, the airport was surrounded by all the metralladoras and oh. all the guns and so forth. And, you know, my, my wife is looking down and she's like, uh, 
what what's all of that and i'm like well you know there's sort of a like a war that we're that that's yeah. in el salvador yeah. and we walked out of the airplane and the military had a whole bunch of folks running down with grenades and and things on on her my she got off the plane to go to the bathroom she ran back onto the plane she <laughs> so i mean i bring that up for a special reason i bring that up for a special reason when you're insulated here including the kids mm -hmm. that are here now even whether they're the kids of immigrants or whatever they don't understand mm -hmm. the kinds of things that we've lived through being a part of a Central America, South America, or places where invasions have occurred, where all these start, sort of issues that then lend itself to create these communities, the sanctuary cities, et cetera, that yep. you're talking about. Yes, you encapsulated it beautifully there. And ultimately, I think what we're pointing to here is that there is the origin point of our story, which is mm -hmm. tragic. Right. Uh, U.S. intervention, uh, U.S. Ex capitalist exploitation in the region going back over a century, mm -hmm. right? The uh, Monroe Doctrine. Monroe the, Doctrine, uh, yeah. All that Carry stuff. a big stick, yeah. And uh, and then getting uglier and uglier across time so that in the 1970s, uh, the uh, 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 Plan Condor, uh, the CIA involvement in, in South America and Argentina and the mm -hmm. Dirty War in Chile, the mm -hmm. overthrow of, uh, uh, Pino, uh, of uh, uh, Allende. Allende, Allende. Allende. Mm -hmm. and, so, so all those or that, that origin point is dark. It's tragic, and there's a lot of people to remember, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Who are disappeared, and we need their faces. We need their stories. We need their names. When we have the discussions about sanctuary cities, when we have the discussion about immigrant families, what you know, it always comes across as something like. Uh, we are there to just give a handout to these folks. Uh, we are there to, it's always a negative as opposed yep. to seeing it in, uh, in, there are two ways that one must see this in my opinion. One, there is an immigration issue of people coming over, which needs a san sanctuaries because of policies that we've had that created those realities. Yeah. And numero dos is that the interesting thing is that the immigrants that had the wherewithal to make it over here, right, to get over here. And I, I, I'm not saying this for a pat on the back, but generally are the ones who were able to do so, the stronger ones who are able to leave, which means when they come to a country like this, they overperform. And I think that is what you actually see. Mm -hmm. No matter what you're doing, if you're, if you're picking grapes or if you're an engineer, mm -hmm. sure. you're overperforming because of who you are and what you went through. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. no, I, I think, yes, you definitely. And, and I think the one thing that, I am always advocating for is the fact that they're also giving back, right. you know, and they're working with their communities in their places of origin in order to empower them as well. Because, you know, and I can say that from personal experience, mm -hmm. some of the work that I do in, in El Salvador, but also friends, mm -hmm. you know, who they, you, they create um, organizations. They're, you know, going and um, making sure that there's like the most basic um, things in, in those aldeas, in those mm -hmm. um, uh, caserillos so that people don't have to make the journey, right. you know, or even getting even more political um, in, in really, you know, um, being activists for their communities and making sure that, you know, policies, um, that the correct policies for their communities are the ones that start getting in, in place. And so there's, um, I think that, yes, you know, there, there's that moment of, you know, we, we provide sanctuary, we provide these services, but then yes, there is definitely a huge return on that. There's mm -hmm. a huge return. And that's the part that we continue to overlook the part that we continue to not talk about the one that we continue to not highlight. And it's important for us to do that, you know, because again, going back and looking at our, younger generations, now we see, um, you know, second generations, third generations who are doctors, mm -hmm. who, you know, are, are in places of privilege and power, and they need to understand this genesis in order for them to also understand the privilege that they have and ensure that they are using it correctly for our communities. That is so important for several reasons, because I mean, uh, you know, we have a tendency in the United States to be a very insulated community, to have insulated communities. And when you move up in stature or class or whatever, we're taught to 
pretty much forget about where we've come from. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I'm not only talking about, let's say, from the immigrant community. I'm talking for, about the American community at large. If you take a look at the class separation, it's like you made the jump ship. You are invited into the other class. Mm -hmm. And suddenly the, the things that you support, the policies that you support, the types of taxation, etc., no longer interested in yeah. it, right? Because I've made it. I got mine. You get yours, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. And, th and that's something I think that plays out in immigrant communities in a very particular right. way. Because we come from caste societies mm, right. already, yes. right? With very hardened yes. you know, class structures. So when we come over here, I mean, my, just think of my grandfather. My grandfather kind of made it in this country, mm -hmm. got, became a homeowner. I'm talking about the Mexican side of my family. Mm -hmm. And he would talk about the recently arrived immigrants. He would look down on them. Right. Say, they're chusma. Yeah. Which is like a hayseed or you know, yes. low, low, low class. You know, because I'm that's that very phenomenon that I've made it, which is, it drives against solidarity, mm -hmm. against you know recognizing that we're all kind of like victims in this structured system that does not allow for mobility and equal justice and opportunity and et cetera, et cetera. And of course, ultimately, that's what the, the struggles for liberation in, in the global South have all been about. So when, once you cross the border, ideology becomes particularly powerful. Right. Mm -hmm. And what I think is uh, we have, uh, every time there's a crisis point, point, like in the 80s and today, um, there is another opportunity to chip away at those structures, mm -hmm. ideological structures that, that prevent us from enacting solidarity. This is a moment that is calling upon people, all people of good faith to uh, recognize that we're in this together. The pandemic was the biggest call of all globally mm -hmm. to say, hey, we're in this together. Mm -hmm. It also highlighted the deepest ideological divide, you know, the starkest right. ideological divide mm -hmm. that keeps us from enacting solidarity. But I'm hopeful because in the end, when we talk about Little Central America 1984, the production, and thinking about that moment and where we are today, can we say the glass is half empty or half full? I can say half full because the airport in San Salvador today is named Oscar Romero Airport. Wow, okay. You know, Oscar Romero today is a saint. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, in 1980, there are people, you know, that uh, a lot of people in El Salvador on the right wing, you know, supported the fact that he had been killed. Right. I heard people say this. Right. And today right. he's a saint, right? Our community has not only survived, as Maria Vilma said, it has thrived. And there are 250,000 Central Americans living in the Houston, the greater Houston Is it that areas many? Of, oh, wow. Million. It's, it's actually more. You know, that, that's, what, that's what the census tells us. But if we really start going into the communities, we know that there's more. Wow. That's how big you, it is. You know, it's interesting that when, when, you, when you made mention about that issue with um, uh, the, the caste system or whatever, it's funny because a guy that does some work for me, um, he's from Mexico. And uh, I told, you know, when he found out that I'm a full time activist and do all this kind of work and, and, and so forth. Uh, and he, he said, you know something, um, uh, w w why do you bother? And then I said, um, what do you mean by why do you bother? He said, um, well, you know, uh, I'm going to tell you something. And he's not, he said, he, he gave me some info about his status. I won't mention it here, but he gave me some info about his status. And then he said, and you would not imagine the people that I have the hardest time with are my own yeah. people, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. uh, de Guanajuato. Uh -huh. Okay. Right. So, I mean, um, it, it, that that moved over here and yeah. made it right uh, and he said the folks that pay me the least the <laughs> folks that do I, and you know and he was saying i and i, I what, what we kept on talking about and i was like well you can actually be that template you can actually do the teaching i mean i imagine you will have a lot of sub i, I want to back step a yeah, minute yeah. how do you come to a town a city like houston and within what you've written, yeah. incorporate local artists yeah. and make it flow in such a manner that it looks like a seamless production. Yes. So uh, the the writing is first person. Elia Arce, our director and co-writer, uh, and I mm -hmm. are from that generation, from the right. 1980s generation. Right. We lived the conflict very closely and um, so are recalling that moment. So there's this general historical cultural background mm -hmm. because we recreate the moment 
culturally through music and poetry. And the music is the, 1980s, the best of Latin American 1980s new song, what they call the new song movement, mm -hmm. which was a great aesthetic innovation, beautiful, beautiful compositions that had deep social, historical, right. political content at the right. same time. Great poetry telling a big political story. Right. So that's part of this presentation. So that's kind of like the overarching, you know, uh, container of the show, but within which community voices can flow through. Uh, Maria Vilma's uh, cohort from the Central American Collective, women are declaiming, the clamadores, we call them in Spanish, mm -hmm. declaiming, you know, poetry of several wonderful Central American poets. And, this, and the family that I mentioned earlier, the Benitez family, uh, are, are acting out these key roles. So there's this, there's this overarching structure, but there's this, all this space that, that, uh, that the, we, we invited the community. Well, the, the community invited us in. Right. And now <laughs> we're inviting the community in and creating this. Like how you together. trick Vilma into becoming a, exactly. an active life poet, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> and That's she right. did it. <laughs> and I'm she, doing it. <laughs> and she's doing it. I, I should say that she's doing it. You know, and, and actually, you know, I, I really enjoy that. You know, it's like when, when people, uh, there would be people who say, I would like to talk about, I'd like you to talk about something like this on the radio. And I would tell them, okay, good. Come on in, talk about it. And he's like, no, I meant you talk about it. I said, why me? I mean, yeah. you, you come in and you talk about it. Yeah. And you know, that, that the, the people appreciate that more mm -hmm. so, even the listeners that are out there. Like I can imagine those that are listening, uh, the, the, whichever part of the immigrant community listening to, whether it's been uh, from Central America, Latin America or elsewhere are sure. saying, wow, we have a voice, eh? We got a voice. Yes. You know? And and the voice is our community in relationship with allies, right? Because right. We, our, our community could not make it alone back then. No not, community we're not, can. We're not, we're not total victims either. Right. We don't need handouts. Right. But we need collaborators and allies. Right. And a generation later, we're recalling well, the reason we're at the Unitarian Universalist Church on Fannin mm -hmm. is because that was a sanctuary right. in the 1980s. Right. Yeah. Refugees slept on the altar in there. And, and one of the people who's going to be part of the production slept on the, 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 the altar with them. At, at the university. And yeah. you know what? Yes. The one in, in, uh, in, in the woodlands as well, they were a sanctuary church uh, in, that's further north, northeast Houston. Yes. They were a sanctuary yes. church. And I think they had a family that they brought in during, you know, with, with all of this happening. So it's important. But I, I, what, I, what I like about what, what both of you promote here is that this isn't about victimhood. This is no. about collaboration and, mm -hmm. and 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 again there is no uh, and and you know when i remember when i came here right and whenever i i was always political and i get political and people say you damn import you don't be telling me this you come into my country and i i would stop them right there and say first of all i feel the same rights to this country mm -hmm. no less no more than you the only person that i will bow myself to of being in this country or the indigenous that's been here for tens of thousands of years. Sure. So therefore, as far as I am, I am, my feet are planted here in the United States, your mm -hmm. feet, your feet's planted, your feet's planted. We are 100% parts of it from the day we stepped on it, irrespective of how we stepped on it. And I, I think all immigrants must have that because we should never, ever allow anyone to think they have better buy into this country mm -hmm. than we do. Your thoughts? Absolutely. I mean, uh, I do, <laughs> I call myself a Mexican Salvadoran American. Right. Right. Uh, I claim these identities mm -hmm. in the big Americans. Right. When we say America, we have Latin America, we have Central, we have South, yeah. Central and North America. Right. It's a big two continents that come right. together in Panama, right? Right. And, uh, and uh, our great leader, uh, Simón Bolívar. Simón, right? la Revolución Boliviano. Right. El, el Libertador uh -huh. wanted to have us all together. Right. Right. 
And the idea was he could see it even back then uh, how the United States was becoming a dominant force. Right. And he thought the only way to balance that that uh, hegemony was for Latin America to become united. Right. We're still working on that today. I, 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 want, I want to tell you <laughs> yeah. something, dear, because I brought this up in several programs. Uh, and starting with Venezuela, a lot of people love to hate on Hugo Chavez. And yeah. uh, I'm not going to we, we won't get into the political of Hugo Chavez, but I'm going to say the theory of Hugo Chavez and the Bolivian Bolivarian Revolution yeah. and having having a pole in the South, yeah. meaning Brazil, Argentina, Peru, Ecuador, yeah. Yeah. on a on a single monetary currency and these other issues. There was some merits to that, yeah. right? And you don't have to like. Uh, these people to understand that there's some merits to having central, I mean, a, a not having one dominant factor in any particular hemisphere. Mm -hmm. No doubt. Yeah. Yes. And that's true uh, geopolitically. And it's true in a city. Yes. Like Houston, which is a microcosm of the world mm -hmm. of the region. Yes. And the Central American voice is emerging and people like, like in the Central American Collective, you guys have done stuff with the Holocaust Museum, right? Other big institutions now. So the voice is emerging and balancing out the power relationship. And it's important. No? Yeah. Go ahead. Did you want to? Eh? Yeah, no, I, it, it is very important. It is very important to continue to empower our communities. I mean, that that's really what it comes down to, right? Um, being able to ensure that all the voices are heard. And then from a geopolitical system that, yes, that there is more of a balance. And ironically, more of a balance is better for it the individuals of every of everybody in other words if you have you you lose you lose it when there's not pulls and pushes you have to have different poles so that we can come to the best solutions right no doubt and i think we have lessons little central america 1984 recalling that moment Ultimately, out of that Cold War context, you know, the solidarity movement with Central Amer against inter American intervention in Central America, we changed U.S. policy. Absolutely. The United States did not w get its objectives uh, from the Reagan-Bush era right. in Central America. We pushed back so hard mm -hmm. here and in Central America that the course of history changed. So talk about balancing, you know, yeah, and, I, and I think that that's something that's starting to happen now, yeah. you know, and, and I'm seeing it right now here in Houston uh, with everything that's going on um, with all of these Central American voices just ri rising mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, um, before you, you everything, everything that you heard about Central America was always the negative right. was everything. And now we're starting to see, to really um, see that, okay, these are some of the leaders in these different spaces. Mm -hmm. These are some of the creatives in these different spaces. Um, you know, our, I, I speak with a lot of educators mm -hmm. um, who continuously ask me for more support, uh, you know, through Central mm -hmm. American Collective, which is uh, the organization that I founded, mm -hmm. where we're uh, teaching about Central America through art and culture. And, you know, they continue to ask for more support because they're seeing that in their classrooms, what used to be a very Mexican, um, heavy Latin right. American representation is now you know, changing. I am so glad to hear something like that because, again, there there are different cultures. Actually, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the 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 Latin American, rather, the Central American culture has a a, a very strong Caribbean pull. <laughs> uh, you know, so I mean, it is great to see that you have all of that. Um, let's see. Anyway, folks, don't forget you're listening to Politics on Right on KPFT 90.1 FM Houston. Thank you guys so kindly for being here. We have board the boards. Rico is on the boards and the phones. Stuart's on the phones. Adia first. Well, you know, we really want to invite everybody to come out and support this show. It is so important for our community. We need to, you know, we always say that um, we have to spend our money and spend our energy with uh, within our community in order mm -hmm. to continue for it to continue to uh, grow, this is an opportunity for right. that. Thank you very much, Maria. Ruben. Uh, estoy muy emocionado de estar aquí en Houston. Thank you so much for the invitation to talk about Little Central America. It's poetry, it's music, it's remembering what we need to remember to be able to walk into a better future together. Well, look. Maria, muchísimas gracias por estar aquí. Y también Rubén, gracias. muchas gracias por Qué estar gusto. aquí también. It was a gr I mean, I enjoyed the conversation. And, and more, most importantly, I'm glad that you're centralizing not on one country, but on the, the entire Latin American 
Central American experience. Thank you so kindly for being here. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí. A usted. Ok, hermano. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.